Hi there! This is me, Valeria Lindstrom, and welcome to my channel. For those who is new here, let me briefly introduce myself. I am a Russian girl living in Spain. I observe Russian politics and translate videos created by most outstanding representatives of Russian civil society, though most of them are in exile now. I started this channel not very long time ago, so if you want to support me, please give me a like now. You always can cancel it later if you do not like the video. Today we are going to talk about Russian elites and who is who in the wartime Russia. Who are they? People who surround Putin and what role do they have? But why is it so important for us? It is important because it will define the way Russian political environment looks like after Putin. The first and the most bizarre figure is Dmitry Medvedev. Some people know him because of his funny, though quite scary and aggressive tweets and predictions on the future of the United States. The others still remember that he used to be a president of Russia between Putin and Putin. But only the biggest and most hardcore fans remember his epic dance. Saying that he changed a lot is saying nothing. From a timid and relatively democratic politician, he became an aggressive and absurd meme character. These days, Medvedev tends to use Twitter and other social media platforms for shitposting about the United States and European officials, as well as making thinly veiled threats to attack the United States and wipe Ukraine from the map. We are fighting against those who hate us, who ban our language, our values and even our faith, who plant hatred on the history of our fatherland. There is a part of the dying world against us today. It is a bunch of crazy Nazi junkies, the people fooled and frightened by them, and a large pack of barking dogs from the western kennel. With him is a motley pack of grunting piglets and narrow-minded philistines from a collapsed western empire with drool dripping down their chins from degeneration. They have no beliefs or ideals except their own filthy habits and their own self-imposed standards of double-think, which deny the moral high ground granted to normal people. Therefore, by rising up against them, we have acquired sacred power. We listen to the Creator's words in our hearts and obey them. Those words are what give us the sacred purpose. The goal is to stop the supreme ruler of hell, whatever name he uses, Satan, Lucifer or Iblis. For his purpose is destruction. Our goal is life. When Medvedev became a president in 2008, after Putin's first two presidential terms in office, there were hopes, both in Russia and in West, that reform was still possible. Indeed, Medvedev was very different. At just 42 years old, he was largely untamed by the Soviet political system, having graduated from law school just a few years before the fall of the Berlin Wall. He talked the talk, calling out the country's weak democracy and ineffective economy. And he appeared to embrace the technological optimism sweeping the world. Seeing that, Barack Obama pursued a reset in the country's relationship with Russia, traveling to Moscow during his first year in office. In 2011, a video of Medvedev dancing to the 90s Russian pop hit American Boy was leaked online and quickly went viral. Medvedev confirmed authenticity by tweeting, were rocking out last year at a reunion with my university class. Despite Medvedev's rhetoric, it gradually became clear that he was little more than a placeholder for Putin. After flirting with running for a second term in 2011, Medvedev quickly stepped aside to allow Putin to, 
to return to the presidency. On the one hand, I think that Medvedev at that moment was some kind of a chance for us still. Or we can say that he actually didn't become this chance because nothing happened. But even considering the bills that were introduced into the Russian parliament and were adopted there all this time, it was kind of clear that in general there was an idea of change for the better. From what has been preserved, there is this law on the declaration of income by officials, and it's perhaps the only legacy of Medvedev that we still have and that has not been cancelled. I think that for a second he apparently believed that he even wanted to go for a second term and fire Putin. For this small thought, I think he is being punished nowadays. As time went on, rumors swirled in Moscow political circles about Medvedev's increasing alcohol consumption. And in 2020, Putin told him to resign as prime minister, but he gave him a token job as a deputy chair of the Security Council. Some specialists believe that a big part of his current behavior is a sense of personal anger and resentment at political Russian liberals, who in the end did not accept him. Medvedev's physical transformation is as extraordinary as his ideological shift. A decade ago he was boyish, nerdy and seemed almost charmingly awkward wearing a suit and conducting the business of state. Now he looks puffy faced his eyes glazed over as he makes an awful speech against the west кажется что радикальность санкционной политики ограничена лишь невротической фантазией ее авторов а также ощущением собственной безнаказанности Medvedev's rebooted persona is an apparent attempt to retain political relevance in a climate that has darkened significantly in the decades since he left the presidency the question is is he really fighting for his future place in post-Putin Russia? Now in Russia, there are two people who have greatly strengthened themselves due to the war. These people are Ramzan Kadyrov and Evgeny Prigozhin. According to court documents obtained by Medusa, an independent Russian media, Prigozhin was convicted of assault, robbery and fraud in 1981. He was sentenced to 13 years in a penal colony and was released in nine years around the fall of the Soviet Union. Prigozhin founded one of his major companies, Concord Catering, in 1996 as he started his restaurant business. Over the next decade, Prigozhin's catering business received lucrative government contracts to feed Russia's schools and military as well as an opportunity to host state events. He also heads other companies and financed one that has been accused of meddling with the United States election. The company did so in part by creating false United States personas and operating social media pages for them, discussing politics and social issues. Prigozhin previously denied his involvement, but in November 2022, he admitted to interfering in Western elections. But why is he so interesting for us now? In September, Prigozhin claimed to be one of the founders of a Russian mercenary group known as Wagner, after years of denying involvement with the organization. Wagner was formed in 2014, and it is not a legally registered entity, Mercenaries are illegal under Russian law, but the group is still often seen as a de facto private military service for the Kremlin. Wagner troops were first deployed during Russia's annexation of Crimea, and then they were used in DNR. Wagner also sent soldiers throughout Africa and the Middle East. United Nations investigators accused the group of committing war crimes in 2021. More recently, Wagner has aided Putin's invasion in Ukraine. As Russia's invasion in Ukraine wore on, Prigozhin began recruiting convicts to serve in the Wagner group. In September, footage emerged of a man strongly resembling Prigozhin, who was addressing men in a Russian prison yard. In this video, the man offered a deal Fight for the Wagner Group in Ukraine for six months and you get a pardon. Those who sign up and then run away will be executed, he said. 
Prigozhin's threat that he would punish any reputed prisoner who deserted was chillingly backed in November 2022. A video emerged of the brutal killing of a man who identified himself as Evgeny Nuzhin and who said he had signed up to serve with Wagner Group as a prisoner, but then he surrendered to Ukraine. It is still unclear who committed the execution, but Prigozhin acknowledged the video by calling him a traitor in a statement that celebrated the man's death. I think he's pretty marginal though. Most likely he will not play any key roles, but in a situation where no one else takes a chance and Prigozhin, in principle he's a rather adventurous person, quite brave, and it seems that he communicates with Putin from time to time. So, in principle, he can now probably start to talk about succession. As the system has been collapsing, well, just two years ago this seemed impossible. He was too small, too marginal for him to discuss strategic questions with Putin. Now, as the state as a whole thing is degrading, it is becoming more and more like a failed state. Well, look at now um, how the mobilization is going on. And this is not a one-time story when something didn't work out there, or there are no machine guns or bulletproof vests, and the soldiers were left without equipment. The same is happening all over the country. The soldiers arm themselves at their own expense. Soldiers arm themselves at their own expense and go to war. This is feudalism in principle. This was the case before the modern era. But starting from the modern era, arming soldiers is the task of the state. So as the state resembles more and more the failed state, and the effectiveness of the bureaucracy, the ruling elites decreases, and the effectiveness of the state institutions decreases, well, actually Prigozhin becomes an increasingly large-scale figure. And it's not that he is getting bigger, but everything else is getting smaller. Ramzan Kadyrov has been the head of a Chechen Republic since 2007. He now is the longest-serving high-ranking regional leader in Russia. The Chechen Republic has been relatively stable under his leadership, following the decades of limbo between independence and belonging to Russia, with two bloody wars waged against the Russian Federation, both of which the Chechen Republic ultimately lost. Ramzan Kadyrov is known as an ally of President Vladimir Putin, even referring to himself as his foot soldier. Several decades ago, though, his alliance was not with Russia, but with Chechenia. Ramzan Kadyrov was born in 1976, and as a young man, he joined Islamic separatists seeking Chechen independence in the early 90s. The first Chechen war ended in 1996 after Russian forces intervened to prevent the Muslim-majority republic seceding. Following a second war, Russia's new president Vladimir Putin placed Chechenia under direct Kremlin control, installing Ramzan Kadyrov's father, Ahmad Kadyrov, as head of the region's administration. By this time, in the late 90s, Ahmad Ramzan and his son, Ramzan Kadyrov, had abandoned Chechenia's separatist movement, switching alliances to Russia. In 2003, Ahmad Kadyrov became Chechen president, with his son Ramzan serving as chief of security. Since then, Ramzan Kadyrov has controlled a militia of pro-Russian Chechens, the so-called Kadyrovtsi, who were committed to suppressing any remaining separatist elements. This militia is believed to have committed widespread human right abuses, ranging from abductions to torture and killings. And Ramzan is supposed to have personally participated in such crimes. The Kadyrovtsi are also believed to have kidnapped business figures to extort money. Kadyrov also happens to be one of those few people in Russia who vocally criticized the mistakes made during the invasion in Ukraine, especially during Ukraine's successful counteroffensive in August. His criticism of the Russian military and organizational failures, pointing out the high losses that Russian army suffered, might have contributed to the removal of the commander of the Central Military District, Colonel General Alexander Lapin, from his position. Here it is important to stress that Kadyrov's criticism is not of Russia being engaged in the war, but of the Federation not being invested in it enough. Kadyrov is so committed to the military conflict that he famously vowed to send three of his teenage sons to fight. 
when he announced that his sons, aged 14, 15 and 16, will travel to the front line of Ukraine, he said that as a father, he should teach his sons to protect their family and fatherland. He also announced that the military training of his sons had started much earlier and it was time for them to experience a real battle. Ramzan Kadyrov has also called on the Russian leadership to use tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. However, this idea the Kremlin has dismissed so far. In the eyes of Russian hardliners, such dedication to the war gives him the moral high ground compared to the rest of the Russian elite, who are prioritizing personal comfort and financial gain over their commitment to Russia. It is currently unknown whether Ramzan Kadyrov will be able to obtain a federal government position or he will be kept as a regional strongman. But his example powerfully demonstrates the viewpoint of Russian hardliners in the war. The rise of Kadyrov should also serve as a warning. The departure or removal of Putin would not inevitably lead to a better Russia. And the destabilization of the current regime might also result in the surfacing of regional and ethnic conflicts, as well as elite power struggles within the country. Kadyrov always uses a political, military or geopolitical crisis in order to strengthen himself, in order to act against its background as a strong figure who has, which is very important, forces independent of the center. This was the same in 2014, during the last crisis in the Donbass, he didn't immediately, but then actively joined the battles of that time. It wasn't even clear what it was, but Kadyrov was there. After that, he certainly got stronger. Now he seeks to prevent being relegated to the background, where in general the Kremlin wants to see him. The Kremlin, of course, wants to see Kadyrov as a reserve regiment, not in the first league. And Kadyrov constantly emphasizes, no, I will be here in the circle that will determine the next political situation, what we used to call transit before the war. Of course, Kadyrov will not allow himself to be relegated to the background, but he doesn't have many options for this. To do this, he has his Chechen security forces, which he therefore threw into battle in Ukraine and uses as his theatrical backdrop, if you like. Kadyrov is a secondary figure. He can speed things up if, for example, at some point he simply fences off Chechenia and his Kadyrovsi. He already saved them now in the war, as I understand it. That is, initially, they took part there in Ukraine. A large number of them died. After that, they didn't go there. They are known to fight in the second, third lines and in TikTok. He saved them. And at some point, he can simply line them up around the perimeter and say, we milked Russia for two decades. Russia gave us everything they owed us. They restored what was destroyed in the 90s, we forced them to pay off, and now Russia is weak. It is useless for us, so we are returning to the ideals for which we fought in our youth, independent each carrier. He will say something like this. But most importantly, he always demonstrates cynicism. And in such societies, which can be called premodern or archaic, when the leader demonstrates cynicism, in fact, he demonstrates his strength, his effectiveness. There, uh, the moral criterion in politics, in principle, is not applied at all. In general, in such a situation, he will look like a winner again. Yes, in the eyes of the Chechens, he will strengthen his power this way. So, I think if he influences federal politics, if he somehow affects the federal political agenda, only in case he acts this way. Then a tectonic shift will occur. The disintegration of Russia will begin. And then there will be a completely new picture in federal politics. But until then, he will not have much influence on what is happening in terms of federal policy. He is not the central character. It is quite interesting that Prigozhin as well as Kadyrov are not scared to criticize the moves of Russian army in Ukraine. 
opposing the Russian army generals and indirectly opposing Putin himself. Kadyrov is a man who commands some of his personal units and is also engaged in mercenaries. He's also trying to demonstrate Putin that he's useful, that he's very effective, but the military is completely useless. I remember he had a suggestion that if each region would train 1,000 volunteers, then this would solve the problem. This, of course, sounds very enticing. But it is easy to pay attention to the fact that this idea of Kadyrov should be implemented by the governors in the regions and not by himself. That is, it is his business to come up with an interesting idea that Putin might like, but he's absolutely not interested in how it will be implemented. I don't think he is even interested in getting something done. He is interested in demonstrating his versatility in comparison with the helplessness of the army command. He is such a wonderful military leader who can do everything. In this sense, he and Prigozhin are playing the same game, the goal of which, it seems to me, is to promote themselves in the eyes of Putin and get new power, new money. And if everything goes bad again on the fronts, who will be to blame? Well, the army will be to blame, because Wagner and Kadyrov's men, judging by their reports, are fighting heroically. Well, this is how they present themselves very well in the eyes of Putin's electorate and maybe Putin himself. And the army is to blame for everything. A very interesting position, and they seem to feel pretty comfortable in this position. All this is a very sad picture. This is such a boil on the political body, which it may not make sense to discuss as such, but only as a symptom. And this symptom is quite bad. The collapse of the state's monopoly on legal violence is one of the signs of the collapse of the state, because it is a basic state function. Any healthy government, any healthy power that wants to survive will hold on to this monopoly till the last. I'm not talking now about only humane power or liberal power, but any power that simply wants to survive. What does it mean? This means that only the state can deprive freedom, property and life. And if someone else starts doing it, the state finds him and stops his activity, because no one else except the state has the right to do this. And to explain to yourself that it's being done on my instructions, under my control, that it is more effective than regular forces, that it works better, that now there is an emergency situation, it is just to comfort themselves. Themselves. Such phenomena are destructive for the stability of any political model. It doesn't matter whether it is democratic, totalitarian or authoritarian. These field commanders, free chieftains, are caught and killed. Doesn't matter if you're a super democrat and liberal or a bloody dictator. You will not tolerate this next to you. If you tolerate it or even encourage it for unknown reasons, it is very dangerous, extremely risky. Such people can really lead to a combat detachment to the administration building, throw out their inhabitants and sit there themselves. It is quite possible. There are no obstacles to that. The question is not to sit there, but but the question is to hold on and then somehow manage the state. Well, just for a coup and a short-term retention of power, such people are often pretty suitable. It doesn't follow from this that this will definitely happen, but we will not completely preclude this probability. But, as for popularity, this is a completely no. different matter. No matter how hard they try to get rid of all educated people in Russia or shut up them, Russia still doesn't consist of criminals and those who sympathize with them. Do not be deceived by all this criminal romance. People are frightened by this. People instinctively, without reading any textbooks on political science, see this as a sign of bad times. One can be not very happy with the list of the men when the idol doesn't come to your home or vice versa, к полицейскому, а да, когда он тебе там либо не приходит на вызов, либо когда попадаешь, начинает из тебя выбивать показания, это очень нехорошо, это большое состояние, но никто даже в этой ситуации не предпочитает полицейскому бандиту. Бывают такие исторические периоды, но их никто не любит, и посмотрите, как долго у нас получалось пугать народ призраком лихи 90-х и продавать им любое властное злоупотребление, как меньшее зло, по сравнению с вот этой самой войной. Such people as Kadyrov or Prigozhin will not gain popularity. Moreover, the one who can rein in these free men 
will gain popularity. The next apostle of order, such a policeman, a figure of law who can kill a bandit, such a person will be popular among the people. Thank you for watching and do not forget to give me a like and subscribe for this channel if you want to support me. See ya!